morning, Jim. Good morning, Marty. Wayne on? Yeah, he's on here somewhere. I seen him just a minute ago. Good morning and, and welcome to uh, our PCB course. That was one of probably the first courses that we, uh, we these two, these three have put together. Um, they put a lot of uh, time and effort into this very important topic. Um, and with, without uh, saying too much from further about what, what the content is, I'm going to hand it over to, to Bernie, um, who will kick it off, kick off the class. And I believe this class is all next couple of days, right? Every day this week. So we look, we, we thank you for, for attending. Uh, we obviously wish this could be done in, in person here in Hanover, but, uh, this will be the next best thing and hopefully uh, everyone is safe. And we want to again, welcome you all to, um, the PCB course. With that, I will turn over to Bernie. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, <clears throat> I think what we'll do, because we only have a small group, is we're going to uh, just introduce ourselves, let us know, you know, where you're from, uh, what your trade is, maybe how long you've been instructing, and uh, why you're, you're taking the class. And uh, I guess, you know, I, I can start, we'll go to the other uh, two instructors, and I guess I can say that I'm going to blame the next 20 years of my life on Jim and Wayne because they're the ones who found me and got me hooked up with this great group. And uh, yeah, so as Tom said, here I am. Um, I was kind of thinking I was like going to start off helping out after PCBs like with ladder safety and some real easy stuff. And then here we have a pandemic. So it's been one hell of a ride so far and, and hopefully things will start getting better here soon because I would like to get back to, you know, in-person classes. Uh, with that said, I am uh, I'm an industrial hygienist. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. I got my graduate uh, work completed out of UMass Lowell. Uh, I've been practicing about 25 years. Uh, the reason why I got into it, it's such an obscure field. My father, after getting out of World War II and surviving it, he was, uh, he was in a mortar platoon uh, or a mortar group as part of uh, in the army. Uh, he actually fought uh, in Germany against uh, Nazi Germany, and he survived that. And uh, when he came back, he entered a life as a, a union carpenter at a local 108 or 122 in Springfield, Massachusetts. They've, they've switched it around since he's moved on. Uh, so I grew up with hearing stories, you know, around the dinner table about, uh, you know, what it was like, you know, being a construction worker, being a union member, uh, having, you know, injuries on the jobs. There was a couple of uh, jobs that my father worked on where there were fatalities. So I decided to uh, dedicate a uh, life of science uh, uh, to protecting folks at work and be able to come home with hopefully all of your fingers and toes and a healthy set of lungs and some uh, you know, money in the wallet. So that's why I, I do this. It's very important to me and I hope that I can make the work environment better for you know, every worker and for my kids and all of our kids when, when uh, you know, they get uh, to work in age. So with that said, Wayne or, or Jim, you wanna Come in next. Yeah, this is Wayne. Can you hear me? Hey, Wayne, you look younger. Huh. That's what retirement does. <laughs> but uh, I got started in this um, project here because we lost a big job in Massachusetts. It was called the Chelsea Creek job. And they awarded all the uh, abrasive blasting and the removing of the coating to the laborers because they tested for peace. TBs. And this job now is, is going into its fourth year 
and they're still on site doing it. So I did this for selfish motives to, to secure work for the, our brothers and sisters so they could keep going. So I don't know if that helps you or not. Jim? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas, District Council lady. Me and Wayne's been working on this going on four years. And uh, I've actually had some friends that ended up sick and they blamed it off on other things more. And so I think it was caused more from the PCBs and uh, they're in bad shape right now. But uh, the contractor that I work for here in Little Rock actually done some PCB removals from the power plants here in, in Arkansas and Northern Louisiana. And this stuff is everywhere and it's highly dangerous to all of us. So, and we are Bernie and yeah, thank you all. Bernie. Maybe we can uh, go around and see who we've got here as a participant. So where, you know, who you are, where you're from, what your trade is and how long you've been teaching and why you want to teach, uh, take this class. So who's going first? Am I going first? Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my name is Tiago. I'm from Jersey, DC 711, local 1331. I'm actually an industrial painter. I've been doing this for 12 years. And I'm actually a job store. And I'm starting as a part-time, as of as right now, on the, on the local. So that's what it is. It's, I'm excited to take this class. And I hope it's learned a lot. And, and let's, see, let's go from there. All right, so you said you're going to be a, a, a part-time instructor for the local? Yes, correct. Nice. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, you can uh, make a lot of difference in people's lives being a trainer. It's a really good, really good route to go if you like it. Really good stuff. That's, Thank you. That's great. All right, who's next? Who wants to go next? Uh, we can't hear you. Go to the mute button, buddy. David. There you go. There you go. Uh, I was... Uh, Sandblaster, spray painter, bridge painter for uh, about 30 years. Had an accident and kind of made it so I couldn't do that anymore. So I'm in the uh, local 43 in Buffalo teaching, uh, training the, the apprentices, the bridge painter apprentices. Been doing this since uh, about 2014. All right. I've got to find out why uh, what what the what's piece, all the PCBs are about to you know find out what I can tell my my people here. Well, you will find out after the end of this class. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Who's next? I can go. Um, Easton Lambert out of uh, DC eighty with Jimmy. Um, I'm an industrial painter. Uh, is where I started. Um, I normally work out in New Orleans, but um, right now, based out of uh, Mobile, Alabama, um, gonna be doing training, you know, if you name it, uh, I'll be doing it. All right, what brought you to this class? Um, don't learn about these for sure. Um, I don't know too much about them. Um, I know they're gonna be like the next lead and as asbestos and that kind of thing, but um, trying to get the groundwork for that before we can start. Um, mitigating those things okay great welcome Thank you. all right who's next not everybody jump in at once <laughs> we know you're out there because we know how many participants are online <laughs> <laughs> well, almost as good as a class <laughs> Yeah. Hey guys, let me just jump in here. Ricardo's having some issues with his um, microphone right now, so he is, he just typed in the chat. He can hear us, but he's just having a, um, a hard time getting in. So he put in there that he's from District Council 7 out of Wisconsin, and he's a field rep and an instructor. So welcome, Ricardo. Should I change my voice deeper? <laughs> Thank you. And actually, this, this is a good, uh, a quick segue here. So we've got some behind the scenes folks that uh, we simply cannot do without. So one of them is Nicole Augustine. And uh, Nicole, who else do we have with us helping out? I think we're all here today. We've got Monisha Quarry. So she's behind, she is the main behind the control, um, 
I guess, auditor facilitator today. I think Alice is with us as well as Donna. Um, so we're all kind of here to lend technical support to everybody. Great. They're going to make sure the ship don't crash. That's right. All right, who's next? Who we got? You hear Russo? I just heard Russo. You hear me? Yes, my name is Mike Russo. I'm, uh, I'm from local 1010, Florida. I've been painting 34 years. I've been an instructor for 11 years. And I teach a lot of health and safety, so this is kind of falling into my wheelhouse a little bit. All right, thank you. Welcome. Who's next? Hi, my name is Andrew Eger. I'm with District Council 51. Uh, I'm an instructor for about eight years, and uh, since uh, 2012. And I've been in the uh, paint trade since 1982. All right, welcome. Who we got left? We've got a few more people that haven't chimed in yet. Anybody else? Is that it? Do we hit everybody? No, here I am. Sorry about that, fellas. <clears throat> My name is Dave Barker. I'm out of DC 53, the industrial instructor here. Been on staff three years, been in the trade 25. Welcome. Thank you. All right. With that said, um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see the, uh, the slides okay? Molecules or whatever they are. All right. So uh, we're going to go through the course. Um, just a little bit of a background. So yeah, it's taken us, oh, about a year and a half maybe to get here. Um, you know, we presented a little bit of this at a conference out in Vegas in December. And then we were gonna, as someone said, uh, you know, teach this face to face, do a train the trainer, and also a worker course together, and then uh, COVID hit. So this is the first class uh, in the series. Um, in, it's designed as an eight hour face to face awareness level course. Uh, it's a very good introduction because, you know, uh, the IUPAT members should know about this stuff because chances are they've worked around it, even if they don't know it. And it's also a good chance that the employers might not know it. Um, and we're going to get into why that is here uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, and then the next step, and, and Wayne and uh, Jim can talk a little bit more about that on Thursday, is we did develop a worker course, which is a worker abatement course, and it's 32 hours. And it's similar to, uh, you know, lead and asbestos, and it's designed to basically be able to remove this stuff safely, both for you as a worker, uh, for the public around you, and also for the environment. Um, so uh, with that said, we're going to go through the four modules. Uh, one will be today, one will be tomorrow, uh, two-hour sessions, uh, Wednesday, and then Thursday will be the last uh, session of the awareness class. I will not be here. Uh, I'm very sad to say I will be about 10 miles off the coast of New Hampshire, hopefully pulling in lots of haddock. Uh, and Jim and Wayne will take over for me. Um, hopefully there's no lightning strikes out there because it looks like it's got some thunder coming in, but we'll see. Uh, and then we'll get back together on Friday and we're gonna talk about this course uh, delivery from the trainer perspective. So we'll go over the activities. There's also a trainer uh, manual uh, that we put together as well. Um, and with that said, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, so this class is taught in four sections. Section one is intro to PCBs. Uh, section two is toxicology and environmental aspects. Number three is regulations, guidelines, and worker rights. And you're going to see that this is convoluted. It's not straightforward like lead and asbestos where we actually have uh, a worker protection law uh, for those things. And it's not as straightforward either under EPA where they've got some very 
detailed targeted uh, environmental and public health protection laws around lead and asbestos. This is different and you're gonna see why. So section three is gonna be a, a real fun one to get through. Uh, in section four, additional concerns for working with PCB. So this is gonna cover you know, engineering controls, PPE, administrative controls, um, you know, handling waste, things like that. It's gonna get into some case studies and then where do we go from here? So we'll, it'll look a little bit, and I'll just give a detail about what that worker class will be like. Uh, and one of the things that I wanna do, so this was designed initially for face-to-face -face learning. Uh, there's one small tabletop group activity per module. Um, and, you know, I like a lot of interaction. So if somebody's got a question as we're going through, please don't hesitate to, to ask it, bring it up. And, you know, Wayne and Jim and myself, um, we're going to team teach this. So even though I might be advancing the slides and, you know, doing some of the facilitation, these guys will jump in at any time um, that they would like and add to the class. So our learning objectives here will be to define what PCBs are, list five sources uh, that you may encounter on the job site. And this one's really important, especially at the awareness level. Uh, list three health effects of them, uh, describe the testing requirements for PCBs under EPA, state the OSHA PEL, describe worker exposures uh, for testing, or I'm um, sorry, describe worker exposure testing for PCBs. So we can actually determine what the worker's exposure is. There are some methods for doing that. And then describe the hazard controls uh, that are job specific and related health risks. So this is an awareness level. It doesn't replace duty specific or standard required training, um, such as you know, uh, respiratory protection, PPE, things like that. The employer still has to make sure that these things are covered. Uh, if you're gonna work around it um, and be exposed to it, at, you know, at any level, you need additional training, and that would be something like the worker course. This is not meant for a worker to be able to abate something. So we want to be very clear, you know, if an, uh, an employer finds out that, you know, a member had this training, uh, we don't want them to think that they can start to abate this stuff, take caulking, you know, out of places and, and scrape down PCB laden paint and get rid of it, that kind of thing. So uh, one of the things is it's designed uh, to ask a lot of questions. So as we go through, I will ask questions and somebody, you know, if you want to add uh, what the answer is, just pipe on up. So why should you take this class? Why do you think a class on PCBs is important? I don't know where it's at. Yep, you got to know where it's at. Anybody else? How to protect yourself. Yeah, how to protect yourself. So PCBs, it's kind of a- Barney. What's that? What, do y'all understand what PCBs are? Any of y'all know what they are, Andy? I really don't. I know it's in caulking and stuff like that, but I really don't know what it is. I thought it was in oil for the so yep. transformers and in wire. Uh, it's in paints. It's in tile, it's in ceiling tile, it's in plastic cups, your canned fish, uh, canned meats, it's everywhere. Yep, 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 that's a good question, Jim. And we're, we're gonna, you know, dedicate a bunch of this module to looking at where this stuff is. Um, and why PCBs are unique, I mean, Jim kind of gave it away there a bit. Uh, they're everywhere. So it's not just a worker hazard. This is something that gets out to the environment. And if it does, it stays around for a while. It can contaminate it, pollute it, pollute our food sources. Uh, and so it can affect our, our neighbors, our kids, our families. So it's not the same as you having a, a worker specific personal hazard of climbing up a ladder on the job. This is something where if it's not uh, handled correctly, it can affect you, your health, but it can also affect the public health. So uh, the EPA estimate, uh, estimates that cleaning up PCBs uh, everywhere in the US, you know, all the 50 states, anywhere between 150 and $200 billion. This stuff is loaded everywhere. Um, public buildings, private buildings, uh, utility centers, you know, dams, power plants, you name it. So there's a lot of work out there. You might've heard something, uh, a statement like, well, you know, your grandkids can still learn about asbestos because it's still gonna be around and in buildings. The same thing is true for PCBs. There's a lot of it out there and there's a lot of work out there. Um, the US is a little lagging um, 
on the forefront of trying to get this stuff out of the public and out of the environment. There is a effort around the world to try to eliminate all PCBs by, I think it's either the end of 2028 or 2038, but to completely get rid of all of them. Uh, and the U.S. has not officially signed up on board as uh, with one of the developed countries of doing that, but it will happen sooner than later, and there's going to be a lot of work removing this stuff. But in the meantime, if you're working around it, you want to be aware of it so that you're not exposed to it. So PCBs is short for polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, so it's fun to use the acronym instead of saying that three times fast. If you want to try that uh, with your kids or grandkids, go at it. Uh, it's a tough one. So poly means many. Chlorinated means it's got chlorine in it. And biphenyls means uh, there are two phenyl rings. So I'll look at that. So here we've got chlorine, we've got uh, biphenyls, and so this is a phenyl ring. This is called a benzene ring, and this is a chemical structure if I were to draw it out, all the atoms that are in that structure. This is the same structure you've probably used many chemicals with this structure throughout your careers. Toluene, uh, xylene, um, uh, let's see, methylene chloride, um, gasoline, benzene. These are, these are basically, these are called benzene rings. It's another way that we describe them because that's the, the chemical benzene, uh, just this ring here. Uh, and it's very stable. It does not break down in the environment at all. And so when we add chlorine to it, it makes it even more toxic, more stable. So these are man-made. They're not naturally found in the environment. So um, they found a similar chemical uh, by doing some work back in the 1800s and they, scientists got together, said, hey, let's make this uh, polychlorinated biphenyl thing. So it's a man-made product. So they put chlorine biphenyls together, they heat it up, and they come out with PCBs. So this is not something that, that nature would have made. So they're very useful in manufacturing. Um, you know, people often say, well, why, why did they come out with it if it was toxic? Well, the same reason they came out with lead and asbestos. Asbestos was, wow, what a wonderful thing. You could mine it, it was a natural fiber. Um, it was a rock that you could, you know, weave into clothing, into uh, blankets. You could put it into, you know, products, um, very flame retardant, uh, hard, good stuff, right? Uh, but it kills people. Same with lead. You know, why did you add lead to paint? Good stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. What, what did it do for, for paint? It lasts longer. Yeah, it lasts longer. Right, um, but it just happens to to uh, kill human beings and wildlife. Uh, so this here, this first bullet's just the chemical structure. You might see this if you're looking at um, you know any reports or things like that about PCBs. And as an instructor, you'll probably be doing that. Um, and this is important because there are 209 different PCBs or mixtures that we that we uh, find it uh, out in use. The boiling point it's very, very high, 527 to 842 degrees Fahrenheit. So this stuff can be under extreme temperatures and not boil, which is why you find it as dielectric fluid in transformers. Oh. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's just interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you know, so it's thin, lightly colored liquids, uh, yellow or black waxy solids. So this can be found um, you know, anywhere in between these, these forms. And it's, again, one of the reasons why it's been used so many places, because uh, it can be elastic and uh, attain its integrity in different types of temperatures. Uh, most species are insoluble in water. So one of the problems, if it, it gets into our waterways, it's not going to dissolve. It's going to settle to the bottom. Um, solubility decreases with increasing chlorination. So the more chlorine atoms that these PCBs have in them, the less likely it's going to uh, dissolve in water. They've got no known taste, smell, and they range in consistency with how they appear. Uh, this is an example um, from some uh, transformer oil in Rwanda. So this is what this stuff looks like. Um, and okay, so it looks like I had, I had one of the dates, right? I had a 50-50 shot. So the worldwide effort is to remove all PCBs in circulation by 2028. We don't, we've got eight years left. It's, it's not long. Um, 
And this is, you know, uh, Wayne came up with uh, uh, an anecdote that he told me when we first started doing that. No, it's it either Wayne or Jim. I think it might have been Jim now. Um, anyway, one of, one of the two of you, tell me who said it so I'll know I can sleep at night, said that they were using this as cooking oil in Africa. And sure enough, I went and looked up some stories uh, in some spots in Africa, folks have used uh, this PCB transformer oil to cook their food in. Oh, wow. That's, that's hard to believe. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and Jim mentioned that it's inside of uh, some packed meat cans because it was an additive to that, you know, that, that slick, uh, plasticky feeling uh, inside of some food cans? That was an additive, you know, to, to your tin cans uh, to, you know, to help with the food. And it had PCBs in it at one point. So I mentioned this before, there are 200 and different nine um, versions of PCBs. They're called uh, conjugers uh, or, or congeners. Um, and they're mixtures. Uh, you're not going to have a PCB, you know, 210 and it's all going to be PCB 210. It's going to be a mixture of a, a bunch of ones, but more or less, um, you know, one than the other. So they're all mixtures. Many have 50 or more in them uh, with varying chlorine atoms. Uh, the last two digits in their code represents a percent of chlorine atoms by mass. So here's an example. This is a very common one, uh, aerochlor, 1242. So the 42 means that chemical is 42% by its mass or weight of chlorine atoms. So there's a lot of chlorine in that, almost 50%. Uh, here we see uh, aerochlor 1254. So more than 50% of this uh, contains chlorine atoms. 130 of them were used in commercial formulations. They've got different trade names uh, and they were very useful you know, for industry. So they were put in many different products. Again, there's 209 different uh, congeners out there. So they're very persistent and uh, stable due to their chemical structure. I mentioned this again. Um, so we've got two phenol or benzene rings here and you're gonna have chlorine atoms on there. And depending upon how many chlorine atoms there are, you're gonna have a different uh, type of PCB. More chlorine atoms makes them stable, more toxic and more persistent. Yeah. Question? Uh, Monsanto is uh, responsible for 99% of US made PCBs. So 1.4 billion pounds were produced by Monsanto from the time they started to get created to the time when they were banned. Uh, production began in the early 1920s. Uh, this here is a, um, a, a photo from a GE plant out in Pittsfield, Mass. I grew up in Northampton, Massachusetts, so I was about 30 minutes away here. And if anybody lives uh, on, uh, you know, the border of Mass and New York by the Hudson River, uh, you might have heard of PCB contamination of the waterways up there. Very difficult to get out. Uh, so in 1865, the first PCB-like chemical was discovered as a byproduct of coal tar. And then in 1927, they were first manufactured by a company called Aniston Ordnance in Alabama. And then in 1936, scientists issued a report, the first one that was looking at um, the effects on workers. So back in 1936, less than 10 years after you know, using these uh, in industry, they found out that these things were not good for you as a worker. So why did it take so long? Because uh, we can see some other things here. Money. Money, that's right. So here's a continuation of our timeline. There's a bunch of stuff in between here um, that happened, but there, these are some of the more um, you know, prevalent and important things. But we can see that they were finally banned in 1979. So 1927 to 1979, that's a long time, right? And for those of you who might have taken any lead courses in asbestos or have taught those classes, it's the same thing, right? These things were developed and used in industry and it took 50 plus years for them to come out and finally admit that these things hurt workers, the public and the environment. Uh, in fact, now we're still having lawsuits 
to John Mansville for asbestos, right? So, I mean, it takes a long time. And unfortunately, what you see, and I like to say this is, is, is part of unionism. The first reason that unions were created in the late 1800s were not for better pay and vacations. It was because workers were literally dying on the job, you know, by the dozens and hundreds. So people got together and said, we can't have our job killing us in many So unions were created to protect workers. That was one of their first goals. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of workers are still used as guinea pigs, right? And this is a good example with PCBs. Uh, was somebody asking a question? Yeah, were other countries like, uh, quicker to ban it than we were? Like, yeah. Yeah. Sadly, yes. Not sadly for them, but for, yeah. for Americans, yeah, sadly, yes. Yep. Good question. Let me ask you something. There's Rick Lambert. Yep. Where are they shipping all this? Are they disposing it or disintegrating it? Or how do they get rid of it completely? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that hmm. gets to our last section. So I don't want to take any thunder away from it, but- uh, no, That's fine, just to save it then, I'm just wondering. Well, just to keep- it might your, be in the beginning. Yep, just to keep your interest, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. And there are not many places in the country uh, that you can send it to as waste. Let me guess, is one of them in Alabama where you can get rid of it? New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. I can't remember off the top of my head. But. Bernie, I Anderson, think we, Alabama. I think we, during our research, Bernie, I think we only found out that there's only two or three landfills or disposal places left in the country right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we, total. yeah. We we have a list of them at the at, in the in module four, but there's not many spots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, with a lot of these companies, their disposal before they were banned used to be in the backyard. Or in the waterways, which we yeah. can't get to all the waterways to, to get it all out. Yep. Does it biodegrade? No, no. Oh, it's like okay. okay, so. How do you get checked? How do you get checked for the PCBs? Good question. So there are a couple of tests uh, that you can do. And as far as being a human, they're kind of invasive. So you have to get, you know, an invasive test to find out what, what your PCB body burden is. And we're going to get into that in module two, but they test food for it, including eggs. And so we're going to see in module three, um, there's a, a scattering of regulations. They're not well put together, but these things are so toxic and dangerous and also political, unfortunately. That's why we don't have a solid uh, regulation. A bunch of different agencies has a small piece of regulation like the, the Food and Drug Administration. So they regulate this in food, such as eggs and fish. Um, I don't know if anybody likes to fish. Well, hell, I told you I'm going, I'm going fishing. I'm hopefully gonna bring back my limit of haddock on Thursday. But I've got to be careful because uh, the bigger fish you get, the more PCBs are in it. <laughs> Just like mercury and like with lead, uh, it's terrible. So if anybody likes to fish, um, we have to be careful. And tomorrow we're going to get into how to find out where you probably shouldn't eat the fish from, which is unfortunate. Very good questions. Very good questions. Um, and again, um, I just want to plug uh, Wayne and Jim's um, overarching goal, which, which they, didn't, they didn't say. Maybe they're bashful. I don't know. But their overarching goal is they want to really get a PCB uh, encompassing worker standard in OSHA, just like we have for lead and asbestos. And as soon as I heard them say that back when I first met them, I'm like, these are the folks to work with, man. These, these people are all right. So uh, I am up for that. So I know that, you know, um, when we first presented this down at uh, uh, campus headquarters at the IFTI, um, you know, Anton, Tom, I think his name was Bob Porto. Uh, they were all up for that too. So what a great thing if the IUPAT can lead the charge of getting an actual worker protection law on the books, right? This would be great. And it would be a first step in protecting not just workers, but the environment and our families and public as well. So. So let's uh, keep going. Um, so the U.S. production of this stuff occurred in, in 1927 until the ban in 1979. 
Um, and I mentioned it was an Aniston Ordnance Company. Uh, the bulk of it, though, was produced uh, from Monsanto. Uh, so they were sold uh, in the U.S. under many different trade names. Um, you know, you can look these up, uh, but uh, Aryl Chlor was the most prevalent one that was sold, uh, that trade name, that, that conjugar. Uh, so based on mounting evidence, you know, to PCBs that they're toxic to humans, to wildlife, the environment, uh, manufacture and importation of them was banned uh, in the U.S. in 1979 by the EPA. Uh, there are probable human carcinogens uh, on top of that, and they are listed as uh, in the top 10% of most toxic chemicals by the EPA. The problem is, uh, as you could imagine, they might have been banned in 1979, but do you think all of a sudden they were, they were taken off the shelves every you know, contractor, employer who had these things as part of their inventory, just decided to go find them and, and get rid of them. Mm, used them up. <laughs> yeah, probably not. They probably used them. And if, if you were well connected with, you know, uh, industry standards and what was going on, you know, you could be a smaller shop or something and you would never know that this stuff, you know, came out and you would probably keep using it. So even though we say 1979, just like we say, you know, when asbestos and lead was banned, uh, asbestos in 79, lead in 78, I always say, if you're working on a building that's in the early 80s, you've got to look out for asbestos, lead, and PCBs. Because chances are the stuff was still used after it was banned. So don't use those, those dates as, as hard cutoffs. Uh, they were found in many building materials that IUPUT members couldn't counter. This is a photo, a historic photo from the IUPAT that I got um, from your web, your International Union website. Oh, I have to say our International Union website because I'm an IUPAT member now. <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember to keep saying that. So if you hear me, call me out on it. Uh, so what I want to do is get into activity one right now. Um, Nicole, Monisha, and Donna, or whoever we've got there, I forgot already, is uh, going to put us into breakout groups. So we've got activity one here, and this activity is titled Sharing Your Thoughts on Health, Safety, and PCBs. We've talked about a little about this already. Some we haven't, so you're going to have to work in groups and try to come up with some reasonable answers. Um, I have on here 30 minutes. Uh, I think what they'll do is give us 15 minutes in the breakout room, and then we'll have uh, about five or 10 minutes to give a group report back. How does that sound? Very good. Nicole, Monisha, anybody there? Yep. I'm here. I'm here. All right. <laughs> We're good. All right. Send us on our way. So. And I'll probably hang back uh, in the in the main room and let everybody work on their own. So we're gonna be on standby. Yep, they're gonna send you into breakout rooms. Now, I can't remember, um, do I have to stop sharing my screen or does it happen automatically? Sorry, Bernie, I was on mute. <laughs> okay. So um, you want it set for 15 minutes, correct? Yes. Okay. Do I gotta uh, sign back in? No, you're no, not sign after there. 15 minutes is up, it'll automatically um, bring you back to the main screen. Okay. And feel okay. free to use your computers or you know phones or whatever to look up some of the information if you'd like. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm on my phone right now, so. But working right, group, guys. come up with the answers. Okay, okay, I'm getting ready to send you guys in. Ricardo still does not have a room yet. Oh, I don't even know what I'm looking for. Breakout room two. Yeah, you should see something that says join the breakout room. Oh, hit that. Just hit join. Yep. 10-4. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm in my truck, so I'm trying to navigate my way through it. I heard y'all talking earlier. But I couldn't 
I finally got the voice to work. Nicole, is Ricardo uh, Sanchez getting into a room? And I actually went to my phone as well so that I could have audio. Okay. This is Ricardo, by the way. <laughs> yeah, hey, Ricardo. Yeah, I can see you. You should be oh, sent yeah. to a room. Uh, let me see here. Is that what you're talking about? They said you're looking to get your birthday. Nicole, Monisha. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, no. uh, there, there's... <laughs> Hell, where'd you go? Well, we could talk fishing for 15 minutes, I suppose. <laughs> I'm looking forward. I haven't been in uh, in two years. I'm sure, it can happen. We're we're practicing uh, physical distancing, so we got a small six-person boat. So it's just us and one other family. Uh -huh. We know that they are COVID-free because uh, their their dad gets tested every two weeks at his job, uh, every twice a week at his job. So I'm gonna go out for an all-day trip. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you talk to if you talk to like uh, like decorators or architects and stuff like hmm. that, they like the yeah. Uh, it looks like it was just they like the idea yourself, of, Wayne, and myself. That was well, obviously you guys being instructors, but I didn't get put into a room. Yeah. So hey, Monisha, like Donna, wants to play with you. <laughs> Monisha, Donna, or um, Nicole, can we get a Ricardo a breakout room? Me personally, yeah, because I'm keeping my own house. That's why I'm busy. The wife, the, the, the wife's hey, cracking, so cracking the whip on me. So it looks like they finally got Ricardo in a room. Oh, good. Hey, Nicole, you, you folks there? Hey, Bernie, this is Donna, I'm here. Uh, we were just texting each other what to do. Because <laughs> right now only, only Monisha can do the breakout. So we, we were calling her. Okay. I okay. thought y'all abandoned me. You're like PCBs, the hell with this, we're out of here. No, no, it's a, it's a lot of people talking and texting each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he should be good now. So Monisha finally added her, uh, added him. Just so you know, without knowing you, you folks there behind supporting us, uh, I'm going to freak out. So <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're here. <laughs> I, I have not learned Zoom yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm actually going to run down and grab coffee quick. I, I heard the coffee maker beep, which means my wife and I are going to fight for the last cup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully I'm going to win. I'll be right back. If not, okay. If you don't come right back, we know you lost. All I think so. You guys feel good about it? Yeah, I mean, what it is is chlorine, biophenyl, and heat. That's what creates it. So that's kind of what it is. And then it yeah. was manufactured in 1927 by the Aniston Ordnance Company in Alabama. Yep. And okay. then, all right, so let's go to number two. List at least three materials that could likely contain PCBs. Okay. Three materials. Plastic. 
We said it was in canned foods, right? In paints. Tile. Tile, yeah. Paints, canned goods. Uh, what are those transformer things, guys? What's that called? A transformer. Yeah, he mentioned that. What the hell was that? Yeah, he said it was transformer. It's what they use for oil in the transformers. Oil and transformers. Okay. Gotcha. Barker's smart. He won't speak up. Okay. All right, you feel good with the three materials that could likely contain them? Yeah, yeah, I think we're good with that. All righty, agree or disagree? PCBs are harmful to human health. They are the greatest hazard that will be faced during your work week. Wait, they are by far the greatest hazard that will be faced during your work week that may include PCB exposure. Wow. Well, it did say it was the top 10% of uh, of uh, harmfulness, so. But, uh, All right, so we're gonna agree with that one, eh? Yeah, that's quite of them. If they're top ten percent by the EPA of harmfulness, ten percent. All right, agree or disagree? PCBs are only a concern for worker exposure and worker health. Disagree. Okay, agree or agree? PCBs are only a concern. A concern for workers exposure. No, they're they should be a concern for everybody. Yeah. Agree. Disagree, but agree. Number five, agree or disagree. PCBs are easy to detect <laughs> and may be recognized without testing. I don't know. I don't think so because he said it was an invasive test to find out sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. PCPs, or no, I don't think it's easy. Yeah, you're right. It was a. Uh, yeah, you're right. Disagree. All right. So number six, we have to match the things on this table, which is going to be hard to do if we're not all looking at it. Um, let's see. Um, so we match this with this. So I guess we say, oh my gosh, this is tough, guys. I guess we'll look at A. 1979, what was 79? 79 is when it was banned by the EPA. Does it say that anywhere? Um, C. Yep, letter C. Oh, it's right in front of me. I can't see that. <laughs> 79C, okay, Monsanto. That would be J, made 99% of. And that was J, yes, made 99% of US PCBs. I think I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Chlorine Adams. Okay, chlorine. And doesn't that make that more stable? Is that what it said? I don't remember. Chlorine atoms when PCB productions were started. Chemical discovered, most commonly used. A congener. I know that word. I don't know where it Adams. Okay, so the, um, I don't know where it talked about. Okay, it would be, it would be uh, I, because the more, I think the more chlorine atoms, I think it makes it more stable. The number of the, number of this makes the PCB conager more stable, toxic, persistent, and less volatile. So I think it's uh, I. Yes. Everybody, everybody agree? Yes. Yeah, I found okay. it on the slide. Sorry about that. That's okay. Good. 
caulking. Rockler, what the hell is not a rockler? Okay, caulking. I think I'm gonna go with H. That's my educated guess. What do you guys think? Significant PCP exposure risk. H H H. Okay. Yeah, that's a way of using it. So I think I like it. For now, if it doesn't fit, we can move our answer yeah. later. <laughs> Check them, not a problem. 1936. What the hell happened in 1936? Um, 1865. So the 1865 was the likely thing, the thing that likely. Um, 19, so 1865 would be E. 65. So that's the first. PCB like chemical discovered. Okay. Dates down. And then I don't know, nineteen thirty six. Neither do I. I don't know that. Eighteen sixty five or seventy six, big times. I'll look in the PowerPoint for you guys, and then I guess I should send out a copy. Yeah, yeah. It makes it a little easier. Okay, nineteen thirty-six is C. No, just kidding. <laughs> Science is G. G G G. Scientists issued a report um, attributing workers' disease symptoms in nineteen thirty-six. Okay, that was G. Yep. I think the uh, Rockler one, second from the last, should, is that F? I think that would be the most used PCB congener. No. I think it works, but I don't really know. Asbestos. What am I missing here? I don't have none for A. A two hundred nine different chemical. Different. I think A is two hundred nine, right? So there's a. I don't know, different chemical congeners. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, our breakout room is going to close, guys. We feel good about our list. I don't know. <laughs> Orocular. I think or I think Orocular is I. I'm just going to swing it. I think, I think the asbestos and lead would be uh, uh, D. Yeah. Which, which one? Asbestos and lead is D? Yes. Okay. Okay. Asbestos and lead. There's E. I'm missing 1920. I don't know. 1920. Fuck. Do you, do, uh, uh, is it Tiago? 
Yes, correct. Yes. Uh, do you do you uh, work just in New Jersey? Or do you work in New York City at all? Or yeah, yeah, I did. A, like I worked six years in New York City. Yes, oh. that's why most of the the, the bridge painter is in New York City. Okay, that, that's yeah. what I, that's what I do. Okay, I mean we'll we'll learn, we'll get into this in the class, but like New York um, City was one of the 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 main um, communities that sort of plowed ahead to try to do something about PCBs. And then we'll see Massachusetts, the state Senator Markley, uh, created a really robust document on PCBs and how it affects our kids and our communities. And, um, you know, Wayne and Jim uh, was able to, you know, connect with their office. At some point, we were gonna go down and actually meet with their, well, Wayne, you talk, you tell, you, you're the Yeah, so Senator Markey's office has, as Bernie said, came out with their own paper and they found out through some conversations with our political people that we were working that way and so they wanted to uh, before the COVID and before uh, the election cycle came up we've had conversations with them in fact Jimmy and I were talking about it earlier Bernie I'm going to shoot her an email uh, again Ms. Joseph just to let her know that we're still interested and we know that things have changed but um we would definitely like to still get together and see what we can do and help sponsoring legislation to get this thing done. Yep. Are you guys think that at one point it's going to be like lead, like you're going to need a, uh, like a card, a PCB card to be working as a, a PCB remover or something like that? We hope so. Yeah, that, that's what should happen. You'll see why. I mean, at the end of this class, you'll see why. At the end of the worker class, you'll definitely know why. But you'll, the, the, be, without a doubt, you'll be like, oh, yeah, this is just like lead and asbestos. Yeah, sounds but like it. it yeah. But as Bernie was saying earlier, you know, industry wants to keep it quiet. <laughs> that's crazy. It gets crazier. Wait, wait till we get into the, the regulations and guidance uh, chapter. You're, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> So let me ask you, I mean, it's a dumb question, but you think all of us is poisoned with PCB already or? Yeah. Oh, you got it in you. Yeah. You all have <laughs> just, just like lead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You like salmon? Oh, yeah. So it's in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, 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 more, the more fatty, oily fish, the ones which are better for us, they're actually in that more. Like, so mackerel, salmon. <laughs> Uh, wow. it's oily anchovies no no not really the nice thing about anchovies and sardines are they're so small there's not a lot of bioaccumulation in them but eating a nice yeah, but you eat a lot of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i eat that many i, I do eat quite so, a bit you guys have said it's everywhere so you think in the bottled water also the plastic that's used in the bottled water uh so uh, no I, the, the new stuff, um, you have to look. Uh, I, I, it shouldn't be in any new consumer like food products still. Right, but see the stuff that comes overseas, you think it might have something? Because I know America probably is fighting for, but what about the other countries? So the other countries are doing a better job of getting rid of it than we are. Um, but you, you, you got to look. I, I, I can't say with a blanket statement, you, you got to look if it's something that you use or that you're concerned about. You got to do some research. Um, and things are funny. Uh, have you heard of uh, DDT, the pesticide DDT? No, I never heard of it, no. Okay, it, it, was, a, it was a part of Agent Orange, one of the products of it. Um, they used to spray school children down with clouds of it to prevent lice. Uh, it was one of the issues that created the bald eagle scarcity because it affected the thickness of their eggshells. It's very persistent. It gets out into the environment. It stays there. So the U.S. banned the use of it, but we never banned the manufacture of it. So we sell it to a lot of developing countries, um, especially ones where we get a lot of our citrus fruits from, like Brazil. So if you uh, drink orange juice, I suggest you don't get it from other countries except the US because um, DDT is the third highest pesticide in our foods that we import. Wow. Because we still manufacture this carcinogenic toxic material and we sell it to other countries. And the vodka you put in your orange juice doesn't dilute it enough. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the side effects of 
uh, PVC, PCB. Oh, we'll get into, we'll get into that. There's a lot of health effects with it. Yeah, that's the problem. You know, wow. like, asbestos has a couple things, right? They've got uh, a general lung cancer, uh, mesothelioma, so cancer of the, the lining of your lung, the pleura. Right. Uh, asbestosis. If you, if you ingest it for whatever reason, it can, you know, lead to uh, stomach cancer uh, and colon cancer, um, rarely though. But so there's got a few health effects for asbestos, but like PCBs, there's a long list you're going to see. I mean, we're going to slide after slide of, of health effects of this stuff. Wow. And the sad part about it, Tiago, in my estimation, it, it mimics a lot of um, other illnesses. And so they don't actually pinpoint it for, to the PCBs because it's not being required to be tested for. Wow. Well, just, just give you an idea. I'm, I'm Rick Lambert. I know you can't see me. I, I don't know how to work this damn thing. Anyway, uh, I sandblasted like Jimmy. You would have think I'd have lung uh, silicosis, but I got asbestosis. So it can be blasting all what I'm getting at. You would think I would have that silicosis instead of the asbestosis from blasting pipes and other material. I did a lot of caulking in my days with uh, glazing compounds, stuff like that. No telling where I got it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Rick, well, that's and, my point. and Rick, I'm an old time blaster too. And I used to love the silica grip. It was the best as far as ripping and tearing anything apart. Yep. Well, I'm with you. And I got 40 years in this local. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm also yeah. blasted, but I'm more concerned about the, the, the paint that we're using now. What yeah. about the zinc? We spray the zinc. I heard the zinc, it's also as bad as lead. Is that true? It's, uh, it's going to be. I think they're finding, I think California has already outlawed it because they consider that a heavy metal toxic. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be the new lead probably in the next 20 or 30 years. That's crazy. Right. So I, I got word that we're all back from our groups. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to go through and just debrief this activity. And we're doing a good on time. And then we're going to uh, charge through the rest of the slides. Uh, so if everybody's back, so number one, explain what PCBs are, where they come from, and when they were first made. So what did we come up with here? They come from Anderson, 1926. Yep. And what are uh, these? Somebody go? <laughs> sure. Are what these are they? Where they come from? Are they are these natural chemicals? No, man-made. Yeah, man-made. Good. Good. How about number two? List at least three materials that could likely contain PCBs. Plastic. Plastic. Can, uh, can get can good. Good. Yep. Transformers. Keep rolling. <laughs> yep. Transformers. Yep. How about number three? Agree or disagree? PCBs are harmful to human health. They are by far the greatest hazard that you'll face during your work. Uh, that may include PCB exposure. Agree. Great. Agree. Agree. Okay. So for that one, I put disagree, uh, just because they are certainly a bad hazard. Um, but so isn't falling off of a ladder of scaffolding, or maybe you're also working with asbestos. So one of the things that we want to get in the mindset of, and this is really important too, to let you know your students know as trainers. Um, Different hazards have different risks associated with them for causing us harm or potentially causing us harm. But we all got to look at trying to figure out a way to control all of them if we can, because uh, what good is, you know, if you control the PCB exposure, but, um, you know, your scaffolding wasn't set up appropriately, right? Or, or, or you left uh, cords on the ground or something like that, or somebody else did and you tripped over them and struck your head. So, they're definitely an issue. They're definitely toxic. They're a significant uh, worker and environmental issue. But don't forget about all the other things that you do out on the work site. In fact, there was a, a study done by the Army Corps of Engineers back in 1998 that looked at hazardous waste operations sites. So, you know, the HAZWOPR sites, the National Priorities List sites where they, you know, you might have, you might have taken the HAZWOPR class, that 40-hour class. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they did a survey of hazards and how well they were controlled. And what they found was that uh, the employers uh, did a really good job controlling hazards against the chemical exposures of the hazardous waste. 
but they did not do a good job about the other stuff like electrical hazards struck by caught in between you know um, excavation hazards things like that so we want to look at these things all together how about number four so that was a tricky question i put in there so as a trainer you know you want to get to understand these well and one of the things that i would suggest is after you go through this class before you teach this again print out the activities fill them in on your own, or if you want to get together with a couple of other instructors, fill them in together, agree on some answers so that you'll have these done ahead of time. And um, some of these are going to have multiple answers. There's not going to be all yes or all no, or you know, all black or all white, et cetera. You're going to have some shades of gray in between there with some of these. But then there are some you need to have the specific answer, and we'll talk about why. Uh, number four, agree or disagree. PCBs are the only concern for worker exposure and health. Disagree. Disagree. What else you got? A lot. So, okay, so the, the way this reads is PCBs are only a concern for a worker. Yeah, right? it, so only one that has everybody. What's that? They're concerned for everybody. Yeah, they're concerned for everybody. And animals and all that. People. Good. Yep, exactly. Environment. Exactly. So, you know, some of the things, again, if you are if you're a worker and you're doing some welding, right? You got that welding fume there. Um, it's a concern for you. It might be a concern for workers uh, around you, right? That are, that are close by. But as far as the general public, probably not, right? As, as far as the fish in the sea, probably not. Uh, but not so with PCBs. Good. Uh, how about number five? Agree or disagree? PCBs are easy to detect and can be recognized without testing. Disagree. Right, this is a big disagree, yep. Um, you gotta test for them. If you don't test, you're not gonna know they, they're there. We already mentioned that they were, uh, for the most part, typically uh, clear, um, typically colorless and uh, odorless, right? So you might not know if PCBs are in the air. Uh, number six, use any provided resources to correctly match the items in the left column uh, in the table to the ones in the right. So for 1979, what was your answer there? C. C, good. Uh, when EPA first issued regulations banning the manufacture of PCBs. How about Monsanto? I'm the only one that has this, right? Jay? Jay. Yeah. Jay, yep. Making 99% of the U.S. PCBs. How about chlorine atoms? I. I. Good. I. The number of this makes PCB... Uh, conjugar, more stable, toxic, persistent, and less volatile. And less volatile means that it's going to be less likely to vaporize in its solid or liquid form and get up into air, which is one of the reasons uh, they were so useful in, in coatings and other things. Um, how about caulking? H. H, good. Maybe a significant PCB exposure risk. 1936. G. Good. Scientists issued a report attributing worker disease symptoms. How about 2009? Oh, it says two. Uh, we were wondering about this. Uh, it yeah. says 209 on the thing, and so yep. we put A because 209, so that's probably wrong. 209. Did I say 2009? I have no idea. Yeah. yeah, you said 2009. Yeah, so actually, and, and for that answer, A, I have to eliminate that 2009 and say number of different chemical yeah, yeah. Uh, conjugates. Yeah, right. Note to self. How about uh, 1965? Uh, 18. Yeah, 1865. I don't know, Nicole. I think maybe I did put whiskey in this coffee. I was joking <laughs> about it in the morning. Uh, hey, my I, wife I, handed I, this I, to I, me, you know. Huh? <laughs> no complaints here, Bernie. No complaints on this end. You're good. <laughs> We're not here to judge. <laughs> 1865, thank you. Good, E. How about 1920s? B. B. Good. Uh, Aerochlor. F. Good, Mostly, uh, most commonly used PCB congener. Uh, how about asbestos and lead? D. Good, made 99% of them. Excellent. So this is a good activity to you know, generally uh, get folks thinking about this first module uh, before we go on. Any comments or I questions? Got, I got a question. Yeah. Let's just say we know, say it's on a wall, there's a plastic wall there, it's been there 30 years. It, 
and we don't want it. We can't afford to take it down. Do they have something? Would you just put sheetrock over it? No. Or coat it? Or what? Or would it weep yeah. through like lead? So, so there are some options for doing this, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in the last module. Uh, we really get into that in the worker class, obviously, because that would be, you know, um, giving the necessary skills to students to do this work. But yes, there are some ways that you can handle it, depending upon, you know, how good a shape that plaster is in too, right? But yes, there are some methods that we can do to, um, to use that. But not for everything. So we'll, we'll get into that more uh, on, uh, on Thursday. Good question. Anybody else? All right, let's move, al move along here. Let's see. There we go. All right, so 60% of PCBs were used for dielectric fluids, transformers, capacitors, uh, high voltage cables. Um, so you've probably seen you know, some examples of these around, right? Uh, those light ballasts. What's that? Yep, at, uh, I got 11.10. So this is scheduled to go to 12 o'clock. We're an hour behind you. Okay. Hey, Nicole, for some reason I can't advance. Oh, there we go. Never mind. I randomly figured it out. 28% uh, of PCBs were used as ingredients in manufactured products as plasticizers and sealing agents. So we can see this is a, a pretty good list. Uh, you know, rubbers, plastics, adhesives, uh, paints, inks, gaskets, sealing compounds, pesticide carrier fluids, um, and microscope slide mounting fluids. 12% were used as hydraulic and heat transfer fluids. And again, you know, the reason why this stuff was a great heat sink, um, you know, that boil, the boiling points we showed were between 500 and 800 something degrees Fahrenheit, which that's taken a lot of heat before it boils. So, um, you know, they were pretty useful for a lot of uh, products. Uh, PCBs were also used in coating. So here we get into some very specific stuff for IUPAT members. Uh, mostly found in green paints, but also blues, yellows, oranges, and reds. And this is something that I didn't know until we started to put together this class. Uh, they're currently allowed at less than 25 milligrams per kilogram of paint or coating uh, with a 50 milligram per kilogram maximum in pigments under, under the Toxic Substances Control Act. So even though they're banned, they can still be put into some of the materials that you use uh, in the IUPAT, which I don't know how you feel about that. I'm a little concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, from 1940s to the ban in 79, we were added as plasticizers to coatings. And these are some examples of, uh, of where they were and why. Um, so we can see added as a plasticizer, so five to 30%. So these things are so toxic, but you know, 30% PCBs added uh, as a plasticizer is pretty significant. You know, that, that's uh, almost a third of your product. Uh, corrosion and, and, uh, and furnace, you know, they're uh, heat resistant, uh, aerospace and marine applications, uh, enhanced structural integrity and adhesion, and, you know, and some other things here that we see that would make sense, right? Why they might have wanted to use these things in some of the, the coatings. Uh, here's a couple of examples, examples of different uh, brands or manufacturers. We've got uh, Sherman Williams, uh, Pittsburgh, and Vogel. I've never heard of Vogel paint. Mm -hmm. Where are they out of? Never heard of them. Yeah. I'm I mean, wondering, Bernie, if it's the Vogel uh, powerhouse down there in South Carolina. That they that's all I think stuff. of. But that's a new plant. They're at uh, Orange City, Iowa. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this yeah, it's is Diamond that. Vogel. Yeah, Diamond okay. Vogel Paint and Coating. Yeah, this, right. this would actually be a, a coating company like Sherman Williams in Pittsburgh. Right. But we, we can see um, at the, the left corner here of every one of these uh, bar graphs, total concentration in nanograms per gram. So um, that's a you know, very small uh, amount, but um, you can see, right? 
green accounted for pretty high concentrations in some of these paints. Then you've got the color blues and yellows and reds in here. So it, it, was, it was used, you know, quite a bit in some of these colors. Uh, now we're really getting into putting some, some risk value, right? If you're working with this stuff. So different paints can have different varying levels. It's not like you're going to go into a room and it's going to be the same level of PCBs uh, in them or, or none at all. So here we've got this, uh, I don't know what we call this, beiges brown paint up here above this um, rail. Had 188 parts per million. This uh, darker paint down here below the rail, 121. Look at the flooring. 5,230 ppm. So imagine if you were grinding this floor or something or, or sanding it for some reason and you were putting that all up into dust. Uh, this, this is an incredibly high amount. Um, I would be really, I, I would be concerned about people working with this up here, if you can see my mouse. Uh, but this, I mean, I would be very, this would be like a, a, a stop work. All right, if I found out that workers were going to be doing something with a, a coating that had that level of PCBs, um, this would be a, hey, wait a minute, we got to make sure these folks got, P, you know, some PPE and stuff. Let's look at some other uh, controls. But this would literally be a stop work. Stop what you're doing. You know what? What? I can't tell you how many floors and paper mills and old powerhouses are painted and they're, yep. you know, right. faded. That'd be really bad. <laughs> Never thought and, about it. And as, as, as Jim has pointed out a number of times, he's mentioned, you know, powerhouses and dams and stuff are, are quite a bit. Imagine all the, the utility buildings, right? How yeah. old are they? 75, yeah. 50, you know, years old? Are they ready to be revamped? Yep. Yeah. You know, right. before be full of lead besides PCB. <laughs> yep. uh, all of the um, nuke plants. So uh, in the underneath the um, national national regulatory uh, commission, the NRC uh, operate a nuke plant to produce energy. It was a 35 year certification. They're all being up for certification right now, and this very well may go in, uh, you know, along with updating their facilities. So all the new plants that we have across the country and in Canada. They are demoing a lot of fossil fuel plants. Yeah. Uh, dams are getting to their latter part of their 100 year cycle and the powerhouses and even on the structures going across and the retainer gates and even the locks. So that stuff is going right in the rivers constantly. Yeah. Or they want wine. Even the water treatment plants with all the old coal tires and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably what it takes as well, right? Yes. And with the Corps of Engineers that Barney mentioned, they're not, uh, we went to a, um, a, a forum that they had in Birmingham, Alabama two years ago, and they are not going to change their coding specs because they have not found anything that will do what the vinyl and the coal tar does for their systems. And uh, so uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. This is gonna have to become law before it'll be changed. Don't yep. you agree, Barney? Yep. Um, Sorry about that. Oh, no, 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 that, that's exactly what we're designed to do. We, 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 uh, we springboard off each other. Um, so this is another just example of the plasticizer application, you know, from, and this is a, a sliver of the time they were used from 58 to 71. So uh, the production for uh, plasticizer applications just in that time period from Monsanto was 144.4 million pounds. So this is just, I mean, it's an unimaginable amount of material that was made. Um, and put uh, you know, into coatings. So this is a very short list of stuff that could contain PCBs. Fluorescent light ballast, window glazing, varnishes, paints and coatings, flooring mastics, window gas, ceiling tiles, flooring materials, expansion joints, adhesive, structural fireproofing, door and window caulking. Whew. Say that with one breath. Do you work with any of this <laughs> stuff? 
I would say that IUPAT works with, I think, almost everything I mentioned, right? Good. And this is a short list. So it's something to be concerned about uh, and that we need to start uh, focusing on. Household products as well as commercial. So now we get into some of the, the greater issues that, that stems past worker uh, protection. Bernie, can you back up one slide, please? Sure can. Look at the center guys. They use it in the pigments and the dyes that we wear every day on our clothing. That's yeah. the one thing that, you know, I, I was really amazed to find out about. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, don't ever underestimate what research can do for you as a trainer. Uh, or, or as a worker, um, you know, I knew a decent amount about PCBs, um, but once, you know, Wayne and, and Jim and myself got into this and making sure we did our, our job, our due diligence in finding out enough about this so that we could have a good course, I was blown away by the amount of stuff I was learning about, you know, PCBs. Um, a lot of different products. Uh, products manufactured before 79 are still releasing them into the environment. So because of their extremely uh, high boiling points and low volatilities, they're off-gassing even today. So if you might have, you know, put caulking in a, in a, in a building back in 1965, they're still off-gassing today. And in addition to releasing into the environment that way, if the stuff cracks off, if it peels, it chips, it falls on the ground, it blows around in the air because somebody sanded it, it's getting into the environment that way as well. So let's take a look at some of the building materials and products that may contain these and what you know, IUPAT members should be aware of. Uh, we got a picture of some guy here, don't know who he is, looking at this uh, label. Looks like Jimmy. That's, that's Wayne, you got a 50-50 shot. <laughs> Wayne's looking at this label of a, of a, of a current caulking tube. Um, the only way you're going to find out if something contains it is if you go to, wh where would you find out if something you're using has PCBs in it, a new product? Yeah, mess. Material safety sheet. Yeah, material safety data sheet. And, and, and now uh, there, we just call those safety data sheets, right? So right. under the hazard of communication standard, as a worker, you've got a right, right? your employer is supposed to be telling you, hey, Wayne, uh, by the way, this, this caulking you're using uh, has some PCBs in it. And, you know, here's a safety data sheet. Let's go through it together, see if you've got any questions, see what you need to do to protect yourself. That's what should happen. Um, does that happen often on the job site like that? Yeah, my finger. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbing it in. <laughs> yep. That's what should happen, right? So the only way you're going to know is to make sure, you know, as you're teaching this class, because it's awareness level, but it's got a big impact. Make sure the students know for new products, they should be checking their safety data sheets, not just for PCBs, but for anything that might harm them. Uh, PCB containing material may be in or on buildings that you're working on. Um, you know, this is just a couple examples at a, at a public school in New York. They may be used in any building material installed before the early 1980s. So again, they were banned in 79, but like we discussed, if they were still on somebody's shelf, they probably were not gonna take it and turn it into their local you know, toxic waste collection facility back in 1979, which I don't even think they had back then, <laughs> right? They would probably use it up or sit on a shelf. This is a real telling example. Uh, we showed you the example of the coatings with the different concentrations. Look at this for, for differences in the, the products here in the school. So glazing, 1700 ppm, uh, caulk between metal, uh, lintel, and wood soffit, 1.4 to 45 ppm. Eh, you know, it's still bad, but, but not 1700. Caulk between metal lintel and metal roof frame, so even though it's a similar structure, 8 to 48 ppm, caulking around windows, 16,000 to 40,000 ppm. What a difference there. So one, uh, your employer doesn't have to test for this whatsoever under the law, and we'll get into that on, on Wednesday. But if they did test for it, what if they only tested a little bit of caulking? 
this example here shows you they could come up with maybe five ppm and they might be like well see jim that's not so bad right and jim might be like yeah i guess not so bad i'll just use the respirator then but literally down the wall you could be up to forty thousand ppm what a big difference and i would certainly implement different controls there for the worker protection not to mention public protection so this is something to be you know cognizant of don't Where you also had the same slide though is this stuff was so good for being a plasticizer and heavy elasticity that if it's not falling out yeah it still looks like it's good caulking but it's still laden with bcbs yeah yeah don't don't forget to bring in the kids thing too bernie yeah because yep. our yep. grade school kids, high school kids, and even college, it's there. Because yep. most of these buildings were built prior to 1900 yep. and the end right. of the 50s. Yep. Yep. No, we got, some, we got some more of that coming up. All right, Wayne and Jim, you twisted my arm, damn you. Damn you twisted my arm. So one of the issues is school districts actually do not want you to test for this stuff. Do you know why? Of course not. Cost money. As long as probably you to come down to schools. Right. As long as they don't know it's there, they don't have to remove it. Once they find out it's there, the, there's actually a piece of the EPA law that says you now have to remove it. So out of sight, out of mind. Bernie, it's like COVID. The more you test, the more you find. Right. <laughs> you know, my, my wife gave me another adage about that. It was, it was in relation to COVID. I guess it's one of these memes. She gave the phrase, uh, for those of you who think out of sight, out of mind means you're safe, just consider the spider that crawled across you when you were sleeping. And I hate spiders. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind for a spider? No, thank you. I will tear my room apart to find it and kill it. <laughs> So here, out of sight, out of mind with PCBs, as long as the school district doesn't test for it, they do not have to get rid of it. So they do not want it to be tested for. Um, so imagine the kind of uh, issue that would be created if the public generally knew about this, right? And right now, this is not something generally known in the public. It's available for anybody to find out if you wanna go dig around on the EPA website. Um, so caulking may be a significant PCB exposure risk. So I, I, that last slide, it said up to 10,000 ppm, which if you're going to get that on your hands, your fingers, you generate any kind of uh, fugitive emission in the air, that's going to be a significant issue. This is an example um, of a, a high pressure liquid chromatography graph, which comes out. It's one of the ways that chemists use to look for different substances. Uh, and what they did is they ran an example that had some PCBs in it with some standards like corn oil, uh, some phthalate, and some other things. And they found that PCBs came out on this test at a certain time. Um, so that way there, they can compare it to other things that they know about, and they're able to determine that that was PCBs. Uh, and this what, was talking. What year was the, that survey done now? Which one? The slide from before? The one you're showing now. Yeah, when? Oh, a couple oh, this, years ago, a year ago, 20 years no, this, ago? This is recent. And this is just one example of a thousand that I can show you about what these uh, test results look like. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> and, and currently, there's no requirement for testing caulking by law. So if you're going to be working, it, it's different than if you're going to drill a hole through a wall, right? The, uh, there's a asbestos standard. Uh, both under EPA and OSHA that say for, for worker protection and public protection, you have to determine that there's no asbestos there before you can just go through that wall, right? Not so with this, with, with PCBs and with caulking. So if you're asked to move, remove some of it and clean it out and put some new stuff in, there's no law that says that as a worker, you've got a right to test that stuff. So you, you don't know what you're getting into. If they do test for it though, because they test for it, for whatever reason, they find it, then that building owner has to remove it. And then that triggers some, some protections for you. Uh, so now we get into you know, something Jim brought up. So let's, let's look at some of this stuff. Imagine all the applications for caulking uh, use. Uh, these could be sources of exposure. So 
so here's an example of school, French, French Hill School. Um, this caulking here was shown to have PCBs. And here's, you know, kids are drawing chalk outlines around this stuff. Uh, the PCB containing material can also be in the soil through contamination. So if it does chip, uh, it does get removed, whatever falls off, gets into the soil. Um, or maybe it's a leaking, you know, electrical system. That's, you know, and it gets into concrete that way or falls under the soil. So when it deteriorates, it contaminates the ground uh, and create an additional exposure and pollutant pathway. Uh, one other issue uh, is this stuff doesn't stay put. So because it is a very thick liquid slash solid, right? It's very pliable, it's very elastic. It's an oil for all intents and purposes. It stains stuff, it migrates. So what we found was that you put PCB caulking in, it's going to get uh, absorbed into the porous material that surrounds it, like brick, concrete, wood, et cetera. So later on in the training, we're gonna look at some of the requirements for when you do testing, you gotta make sure the material around what you're removing is not contaminated as well. If it is, you gotta remove that too as PCB waste. And that gets very expensive. So, you know, at-risk populations could be exposed to this stuff, uh, you know, when they're doing their daily everyday activities. There's more examples here of, you know, chalk pictures drawn around the school. Uh, also, we mentioned this, right? There, it's the, it's the, the, the nasty trio, asbestos, lead, and PCBs. They were all created and used around the same time, manufactured for about the same time, and they were all, um, uh, you know, prohibited about the same time in the late 70s. So where you might find one, you might find the others. These are just some additional examples. Here's an example of a leaking ballast oil. And we've got studies where, you know, in today's environment, you know, a teacher could be working at their desk and they have a drip of this black liquid <laughs> coming down from the light above their desk. And it turns out it's, it's ballast oil that's PCB laden. So some larger communities, you know, like New York City, they are, are uh, actively phasing out uh, this PCB contaminating material uh, to protect the kids, to protect the staff and, and folks that work in the buildings, but it's not like that everywhere. All right, that's the end of uh, module number one. It's 11.33, so that took us about an hour and a half if we were teaching this face-to-face, -face, it would take us uh, longer. Um, what I would like to do, um, if I was face-to-face, -face, let's say if I had 25 students, I would break up, you know, they would be in groups of five. I would give the activity to everybody, um, give them enough time to use different resources to look up answers, discuss within their groups the questions a little greater depth, and then I would have each group do a report back. You know, so typically when I do a small group activity, it can last anywhere between, you know, 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, you don't want to shorten the time for the small group activities because we know through research um, you know, that um, adults learn great from other adults. And from all of our shared experiences during our work, uh, we've learned a lot. Now, I could imagine the kind of group discussions that you could have between IUPAT members who worked with all the stuff that we just showed for their whole careers. And imagine the great learning that would take place if you've got somebody who's been an IUPAT member in the field for three or five years and that they're taking this class with somebody who's worked for 25 or 30 years. Imagine that great learning that would transpire. You can't get that from a book. You can only get that from, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, interactive education with adults. So. With that said, Jim or Wayne, do you guys want to add anything to what we covered today? Um, prep for anything for tomorrow? Or uh, are you all set? Well, I think the one thing to remember on this one is just the dates. You know, it was banned in 79. 
by any buildings prior to and shortly after still could be having this. And all of our members are working in buildings and structures that were built in that time frame. Yep. Yeah. What What do you think about coming up with like a little pocket uh, book with information in it? You know. Yeah. Something like that that we can hand out. Besides, you know what I'm talking about. A little card. Yep. With stuff on yep. it like that. That'd be great Absolutely. information that you could they could keep. Absolutely, we could we could hand that out with this awareness class. And now that I've learned that uh, the folks there that at the uh, IFTI staff are absolute wizards at creating cool looking documents. We could absolutely do that. Monisha, Nicole and Donna didn't laugh, so. <laughs> yeah, I didn't well, hear them laugh either. Like damn guess. that Bernie. Don't let anybody know what's gonna come. <laughs> Guys, uh, Nicole just brought this up. Uh, there is a online PowerPoint. It's on the uh, LMS system, and it is FTI 1145 PCBs. And you can actually uh, go in and pull this PowerPoint off, and you can look at it and and see what you think about it. And then we can turn around and administrate it to our members. Get everybody more educated with it. What's the name of it? It's uh, on the LMS. It's FTI 1145 PCB. Thank you, Nicole. PCB. Okay. And we'll get through like some of the logistical kind of technical stuff, you guys. So don't, you know, don't feel bad if you're having trouble logging in, if you're on the phone. If you need help with getting your Zoom ready, just let us know because um, we do want to see your face. It just makes the class go a little bit better with um, that interaction. And this is the first brand new class that we're doing, um, you know, via this distance learning on this platform. So all that technical stuff, don't sweat it right now. We'll work through it for the rest of the week. And if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us here at the FTI. But um, that's what I have to offer. So thank you. Also, Bernie, I just think we ought to remind everybody that we do offer the awareness course first, which I think kind of gets everybody's peak interest started on this before you start taking the worker course or the train to trainer course. I think it's it's well worth the time to run the awareness course so that they're somewhat familiar with some of the acronyms and what we're talking about. Yep. Yep. No, that's a that's a good point, Wayne. This this is a prerequisite for when folks want to take the the worker course. Um, and just just a plug for the IPAT. Um, when we first you know embarked on creating this awareness class, I tried to look around you know at what some of the other unions have done as far as you know awareness training with PCBs and stuff. I looked at you know the Army Corps of Engineers. I couldn't find anything. There was a very limited. Uh, slide set that I found from another union uh, who will remain nameless uh, and it was it was it was short and it was not you know very adult ed oriented um, this is kind of the first one of its kind you know that the IPAT has created so um, you know this is some good stuff so I, I commend you know Wayne and Jim and their foresight of wanting to get something like this out and um, you know if you want to teach this last to your members, you're going to be able to do a lot of good. All right, I think that's all I've got for today. Anybody have any comments or questions or? If not, I think we can sign off and we'll see everybody tomorrow at 10 a.m. for toxicology and environmental aspects. That'll work. That works. Sure. Sound good? Sounds good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank see you, you all tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Later, Bernie. Thank you. What about me, Jimmy? I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound good. <laughs> Be good, Wayne. We'll right, see talk you. Talk to everybody tomorrow. Yep. <laughs>